Greetings, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel on UCTV, and we're, uh, what's on our mind today is neuroimaging in the context of Alzheimer's disease, and I'm joined by Jim Brewer, professor of neurosciences at UCSD, whose research on imaging in Alzheimer's disease has really been a leading element in helping us understand the course of the disease and how to really uh, perhaps intervene in a way that's effective, knowing so as a result of being able to image the brain effectively. So Jim, welcome. Thanks. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your training, and what are you up to in imaging the brain? Thanks, Bill. Uh, thanks for having me here. And uh, yeah, I've been interested in Alzheimer's for a long time. Uh, I did initial work with a guy named Bill Jagist up at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. That was my first exposure to patients with Alzheimer's disease, and it very much affected me. It's hearing their stories and hearing how they could no longer rely on their brain to do the things that it used to do. And so I decided at that point, even as a sophomore in college, that I would go to medical school and do an MD-PhD training program and uh, uh, study imaging of Alzheimer's disease. And so it's amazing that I kind of stayed on that route uh, many, many years later because, as you know, I was uh, at Stanford with you, um, and uh, that's where I did my MD-PhD. And then after that, went on to Johns Hopkins. And uh, soon after finishing my neurology residency, came here to UCSD, was recruited in a joint appointment between uh, radiology and neurosciences, and uh, very happy to be here. It's just outstanding work in both of these fields, really a, a place that is uh, leading the world in Alzheimer's imaging and, and, uh, and in MR development in itself, MRI, the magnetic resonance tool that we use a lot. Very important tools. And yeah. I think our listeners would like to hear more about those tools. Sure, actually, so the focus today, I think we would like to talk a little bit about some of the new uh, imaging tools that we use here in clinical practice at UCSD and also in our research. Uh, so for our research side, we, I run the uh, imaging core for the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study, which is a multi-site uh, clinical trials group uh, that's headed here at UCSD by Paul Azen really an outstanding group that even the pharma companies come to see how to run a trial properly. And uh, all across the world, people visit the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study here at UCSD and also the Shiley Marcos Alzheimer's Disease Research Center to learn about what we're doing at UCSD. So it's pretty impressive to have come from the high power you know, name schools of Johns Hopkins and Stanford and nobody argues that this is the place to be to do that work. Great. And in fact, all those uh, universities will send their images to our center here in San Diego to have them processed so that they can uh, understand uh, more on a quantitative basis about uh, the images. Because until now, you really were looking at the images and just describing them qualitatively in a, in a paragraph. But we have now approaches that are using computer vision approaches, some of the latest and greatest things that you, has been used in NASA and the military for years and years, but only recently made it into medical practice, mm -hmm. which is pretty shocking. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very excited about that, and we and I'd love to show you about some yeah, of the uh, tools do. we've been doing. Please do. So what I have here on this uh, computer screen is a set of uh, brain images. It's fused between the very high resolution picture that magnetic resonance imaging gives us and uh, a, a scan called a PET scan, a positron emission tomography scan. So positron emission tomography allows you to look at a number of different things because what you can do is inject a slightly radioactive tracer into the body and it binds proteins that are important in either uh, the brain activity or in uh, per important proteins, for example, in Alzheimer's disease. And what we're looking at here is actually the uh, amyloid imaging agent. Amyloid is the bad protein that deposits in the brain with Alzheimer's disease. And what we see on the left here is actually a, a fused image between an MRI scan of an individual actually with an adult Down syndrome and this is a very interesting approach to looking at uh, amyloid because, as you know, uh, uh, individuals with Down syndrome uh, have elevated uh, uh, Alzheimer's uh, risk. And, uh, and, and yet, at this individual at age uh, 39, uh, did not have elevated, uh, markedly elevated binding, even though the brightness you see here is in. Uh, you can see there's brightness of the of the agent, but it's only in an area that's not 
uh, specific to Alzheimer's disease. And so it really doesn't extend all the way to the edge of the image, and that's the way we read these things. Whereas on the right side, what we see is not only binding in those nonspecific areas, but also it is extending farther out into the, the areas that are more uh, uh, where the deposit of amyloid is. So that's the bad protein. And this individual, who's 37 years old, younger than this individual, but this also individual has uh, Down syndrome. And for some reason, this individual has elevated amyloid binding. What's interesting then as well is to say, well, why, why is that? Why is this individual more susceptible to the binding of the bad protein than this individual? And it turns out if you look into their genetics, there's not only the Down syndrome gene or the extra chromosome, but in fact, this individual has what we call an ApoE4 status. ApoE4 is a, a protein that may help remove amyloid from the brain, and, or may actually, apolipoprotein is a, is a protein that will uh, help remove amyloid, and the E4 type is less effective at removing that amyloid. This individual has the E2 genotype, and that is the protective gene. And so it's a very interesting combination that we can look at by studying this. So the images that you're looking at are really reporting then uh, not only the shape of the brain and the size of brain structures, but also the extent to which this amyloid protein is present. Exactly. And so, and in fact, I'm glad you mentioned about the size and the shape, because you can also see that this individual on the right not only has the increased deposition of the bad protein, but you can see these uh, spaces of the brain that we call ventricles. They're normal, but uh, ventricles are normal, but to have them of this size suggests that this patient's brain is actually shrinking much more than this individual, because those fluid-filled spaces are expanding to uh, take the space of the brain tissue that used to be there. And so that's another thing that we measure. We take a look at that to say, well, what is happening with this brain as time progresses? And we can see a markedly increased rate of shrinkage or atrophy in individuals that have uh, susceptibility to Alzheimer's disease. And so uh, we do that in the ADCS, the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study, as a way to measure whether a drug is having an effect on the disease. So in addition to measuring whether uh, a patient's memory is declining, which is a very important component of our clinical trials, we also look directly at the brain and quantify how much is that brain shrinking and does the medication we're giving start to slow that shrinkage and help keep that brain remaining healthy. Very exciting. And I wanted to show you just quickly a, um, a quantification of this measure. So trying to make it as easy as possible to, uh, to understand these images. So instead of trying to go through and tell you about each of the different regions that are amyloid specific or not, we can actually uh, now quantify within each of the brain regions how much amyloid is binding. And then we can also color code each uh, row here to say, well, is that out of the range of normal or is that normal? And you can see on this left scan, essentially almost everything is within the range of normal because almost everything is white there. Nothing's out of the range of normal. Whereas on this scan, you can see the whole report turning red. And my goal is to essentially get to the point where my seven-year-old daughter would be able to say, Daddy, that's an amyloid positive scan. Daddy, that's an amyloid negative scan. So mm -hmm. we call that de-skilling of the reading process, and hopefully this will be a way we can go forward. I was, yeah. So when we look at this picture, what we're collecting here are just a series of measurements of brain volume and, and theoretically also amyloid deposition that allows the clinician to see fairly quickly whether or not the patient is normal or is deviating from normal. Exactly right. And that's what we hope to move the field of radiology toward because there's so much variability in the qualitative assessment. Some folks are very specialized at reading brain tumors. Some people are very specialized at reading uh, lesions due to either a stroke or multiple sclerosis. And a lot of times, Alzheimer's falls at the very low end. They don't really uh, we don't have a lot of specialists that read into the changes, the anatomical changes that happen in Alzheimer's disease, and so we're trying to help with that. And when you say you de-skill, I guess what you're saying is you, if you could take a series of uh, very well-defined images and you apply the software, the skill goes up markedly. You don't need to be a skilled reader of dementia scans 
You just need to have the right software and the right ability to look at the data. And then the software provides you with a lot of insight as to whether is this Alzheimer's disease or is it not. Exactly. That's what I hope to see uh, brought out uh, to you know other places, even beyond the uh, expertise of UCSD, to be able to allow other people to have the data back. <laughs> I want to I want to empower the referring physician to have this kind of quantitative information to put into their overall impression of the patient. And I think that's a, that's a very empowering aspect of this uh, approach to do quantitative imaging and say, hey, here are the numbers. You can help judge for yourself rather than relying on the little paragraph that comes from the radiology specialist. And, and there's new things developing now also here and elsewhere in Alzheimer's disease. Can you say a word about that? Oh, there's a lot of great things, in fact. So as I mentioned, uh, my first experience with Alzheimer's research was in 1990, so that's uh, 24 years ago. And uh, when I left that experience to go into medical training and then do my PhD and then do my residency, I was pretty dismayed and distraught when I saw that very little had changed in that initial, say, 19 years. <laughs> and I said, wow, we're saying the exact same things to these patients, saying we don't know, we don't know if this is, you know, if this is going to progress or if this is going to be worse or there's nothing we can offer. And I think in the last five years I've seen a complete change of that and I'm much more optimistic because I'm seeing that with uh, collaborations with our basic scientists colleagues, we're no learning much more about the process of the disease. We're learning so much more about the molecules that need to be targeted. We're learning much more about the genetics of it. And these give us insights to say, hey, this is the target to go after. And we're really seeing the, uh, the development of therapeutics that may actually start to slow this disease in a super exciting time oh, in this field. Real. Other two other imaging tools coming online? Oh, uh, so uh, I think that uh, certainly this marker of amyloid is has been something that shows us, hey, there's the bad protein, but there's another protein that we would need to look at, and that's called tau. And that uh, protein, of course, has always been very highly correlated with an individual's cognitive decline. Well, just within the last couple years, there's been a development of a marker using positron emission tomography that can look at the tau in the brain. So having all of these markers within direct imaging of the brain is going to be a very powerful complement to our clinical trials. And that's not just in terms of diagnostics then, because then I think what these uh, tools allow us is a window into whether the therapeutics are actually having an effect on the, on the pathology of the of the disease and that gives you a huge leg up in in detecting whether a drug is effective or not because this disease progresses so slowly that it's always been a big challenge to detect whether a drug is working or not but looking directly at the brain I think is going to give us a lot more power to see if a drug is working and so when you think back in those early experiences you can kind of see your career moving ever closer to a time when the tools that you have invented to help us understand these images are going to make a difference in the lives of people with Alzheimer's disease. Well, that's very kind of you to say. I will have to say that this is a huge team effort. <laughs> this is not me developing the engineering of this. What I do is I take what are some very exciting tools coming from a lot of my colleagues and saying, let's apply it to this particular disease. So I don't want to take all the credit for the exciting tools here, but I think that what we have been able to apply and advance the field is a super exciting time right now. We're proud of you and your team. For Bill Mobley and the Brain Channel, thanks for being with us. <laughs>